So, in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful, uh, today I want to talk about uh, an interesting issue. It's going to be like a study case for us. And that is the question of, can you pray janaza inside a masjid or not? Now, you must be thinking, why did I bring up this topic? Um, I like to bring up fiqhi issues for many different reasons. But in this case, particularly, I'm bringing it up to show things are not always black and white and that each of the school of thoughts, the Hanafi, the Shafi, the Maliki, even the Salafi brothers, they all do have valid dala'il and opinions upon which they base their uh, uh, opinion on. If you ever hear a scholar dismissing other schools of thought just outright, there's, that means that that person's knowledge is probably shallow. Because I have to tell you, in all the years that I have been doing uh, Islamic work and my studies in Islam, I have, you know, you usually start off in one place, right? You usually start off uh, like with one school of thought. Maybe you start off as a Salafi or maybe you start off as a Hanafi. Maybe you start off, start off somewhere. And as you learn, you get to appreciate other schools of thoughts. And if you don't, that means you haven't grown. That means you've been stuck and you've never looked at things from the perspective of the others. And so here is a very important question. There are some group of scholars uh, that agree that you cannot pray janaza. You should not pray janaza, generally speaking, inside a masjid. And then you have another group of scholars who say, no, it's okay to pray a janaza inside a masjid, even though the Prophet had a special place for janaza, which we're going to look at that part today, even though he had a special place for janaza outside the masjid, but it's okay to pray inside the masjid. And then they have their proofs, which we're going to look at. We're not going to do an all extensive study of all the dala'ils of every school of thought, you know, because the scholars have discussed this even to the minutest detail, even to the detail of what if the body is outside the masjid, but the people pray inside the masjid? What if the crowd becomes, the, let's say the, the imam is outside the masjid and the body is outside the masjid and the people are so much filled outside the masjid, now they have to go inside the masjid. Even, these de even this type of detail has been discussed. So, uh, I'm just looking at the general picture. And then today, nowadays, nowadays, so we're looking at our tradition from the past and what the scholars said, and we're looking at the practical situation for Muslims today, especially, especially in my case, Muslims in the West. There's no place to put the body outside the masjid. There's only a place to put inside the masjid, the body inside the masjid. Everyone knows this. We even the even the schools of thoughts like the Hanafi school of thought, the Maliki school of thought. When a person who passes away, they bring the body inside the masjid most of the time. Now, some of the masjids, they have a special place, like a gymnasium or something, where they have their funeral prayers. They don't bring the body inside the masjid itself. Now, if you have those facilities, then you can choose which school of thought you want to go with. But majority of the masjids don't have that type of facilities. So you have, on the one side, you have our tradition, and the complications within that tradition, and then you have a practical situation and so how do these two things also come together? So this was an interesting point from that perspective. So let us get started. So we are going to, I'm going to mention some general things because I don't have a time to, I want to finish this as quickly as possible, give you a general view, but give you a taste of the level of intricacies and the, and the level of sophisticatedness that exists in these issues and that how different scholars had these different approaches. Now, uh, those of us who are studying, studying end of times, it becomes especially important because in the end of times, uh, we will have to deal with new situations and we will have to deal with a point of survival, right? Because we are in survival mode, Muslims are under attack and that forces Muslims together and that will force all sorts of Muslims together who are from different schools of thoughts and if we don't understand from the very beginning just because somebody has an opinion that's different from yours or from your culture or uh, lives in an environment where the fuqaha there have a different opinion doesn't mean you just uh, like uh, just 
shun them or think less of them. But that just, it's a matter of the fact that you have not been educated and introduced to their point of view. So, having said that, let's start, inshallah, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And uh, so we're going to start with uh, Najashi. Najashi's funeral prayer. Now, before I, I, I go there, actually, um, I do want to mention that um, the Prophet had his masjid. And outside his masjid, he had his place where he would read the funeral prayers. And uh, Najashi is an interesting case because the body wasn't there. So uh, he did, the Prophet Sallallahu did Salatul Janazah Bil Ghaib. He did Salatul Janazah in the not in presence of the dead body. Was that specific to Najashi or was that something that could be applied generally? You know, some schools of thoughts. They say, no, you can pray Salatul Janazah Bil Ghaib. Salatul Janazah, when the person's not present, you could pray it for them. Other scholars say, no, he has to be present. Najashi was in a specific case. Uh, anyway, that's not the debate we're having today. But we're going to look at wh what, where the general ruling was, and then there's the debate about uh, the praying inside the masjid that took place between Aisha and other companions of the Prophet uh, in their lifetime. And so, let's start with Najashi. Uh, I'm going to start from over here. And those of you who don't know English, uh, uh oh, let me fix this. Uh, uh, let's move this over here. Okay. Uh, okay. So now I think you can get the English and the Arabic there. I'm going to read the Arabic and you can have the English translation there. Anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, uh, when Najashi died في يوم الذي مات فيه in the day that he died خرج رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم the Prophet came down إلى المصلى to the place of prayer meaning outside the masjid okay إلى المصلى فصف بهم فكبر أربعا so the Prophet came out and he made صفوف he made lines and he did four takbirs so this shows and many other traditions show the Prophet used to generally pray outside the masjid when it came to the deceased. Okay. Now there's also a debate amongst fuqaha is Mecca, for example, a big masjid. Uh, is that an exception or it's not an exception? All those issues are there. Um, uh oh. So. Uh, See if I can get this back. Uh, so here you will find again. Kharaja uh, Rasul over here, over here. Kharaja ila al musalla. Bihim wa kabbara arba. And in the same way, you find in the next uh, few traditions of the Prophet again here. Wa kharaja bihim ila al musalla. Fasafa bihim wa so you see many narrations saying the same thing that the Prophet prayed outside the masjid and this was generally speaking the Prophet's routine okay so uh, okay uh, and let's see if I can get one more uh, so the Prophet ﷺ went to the prayer place to pray for Najashi. Now, you can see here that this is pretty consistent, right? Uh, the Prophet prayed in a place outside the masjid for Najashi. And this was the case that was the general case. Now we're going to look at the specific case where the issue of dispute comes in. Uh, so this is narrated by Abdullah bin Zubair radiallahu anh. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, uh, over here, I'm reading from here. لما توفى سعد بن أبي وقاص when Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas رضي الله عنه he passed away. Uh, 
and I want to go to this place. Ananasa uh, Abu. So the, the they wanted uh, Aisha wanted to pray with them. She asked the 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 burial the the body be brought brought into the masjid. Okay. قالوا ما كانت الجنائز ما كانت الجنائز يدخلوا بها المسجد فبلغ ذلك عائشة. So they said, no, 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 don't, don't let the janaza enter the masjid. So clearly there were companions of the Prophet on the side of, don't let a janaza enter the masjid. فبلغ ذلك عائشة. So this reached Aisha. قالت, she said, ما أصر الناس. What happened to people so fast? Right? إلى أي let's see and then she refers to a specific case case uh Allah's Sahil Sahil ibn Bayda إلا في جوف المسجد that the Prophet prayed for the janazah prayer of uh, of Sahil and there was another person Sahil except in the middle of the masjid okay. So let's look at some of the other uh, books uh, regarding this. Uh, so you have Yeah, let me see, let me just uh, bring this up again. Okay, so here. By Allah, the Messenger of Allah did not offer the funeral pray prayer to Suhail ibn Bayda anywhere but in the masjid. So this is the statement of Aisha. Okay. Uh, he didn't pray anywhere except in the masjid. Okay. And then you can find masjid over here, except in the middle of the prayer of the masjid okay so over there keep in mind you had the word musalla over here you have the word masjid in that hadith that we were looking at the previous case of najashi over here we have the word masjid okay al masjid muslim right and then uh, this one is uh, interesting okay abdullah bin zubair anna aisha radiyallahu anha qalat salla rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam ala sahil Ibn Baydaw fil Masjid. The Prophet ﷺ prayed over Suhail ibn Baydaw fil Masjid in the Masjid. Wa Abu Isa had the Hadith Hadith Hasan. This Hadith is good. Wa and then it says about some of the people of knowledge. Qala Shafi. This is what Imam Shafi said. قال مالك إمام مالك said لا يصلي على على الميت في المسجد. Don't pray over the dead in the masjid. Now there's a hadith right there that's saying the Prophet did this, and Imam Malik is saying don't do this, and Imam Abu Hanifa is saying don't do this, but Imam Shafi is saying no, it's okay. The Prophet did it, and Ahmed bin Hanbal is saying it's okay. Ibn Qudama, one of the great scholars of Islam, he was a, he was a Hanbali. He said it's okay. And so the Hanafi said, look, the Prophet had a special pray place to pray outside the masjid. So if the Prophet prayed inside the masjid, there must have been a special reason, which is the case of why they went, were not really in, uh, inclined towards what Aisha was saying. And Aisha said, did people already forget how the Prophet prayed for such and such inside the masjid? But majority of the Sahaba, because the majority of the times the Prophet was praying outside the masjid. But Imam Shafi is like, okay, the Prophet prayed outside the masjid, but that does not make it wrong to necessarily pray inside the masjid. So it is better to pray outside the masjid, but it's okay to pray inside the masjid. Uh, so then, you have here, and Aisha qalat, ما صل صلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم على سحيل ابن بيضاء إلا في المسجد. The Prophet did not pray upon Suhail ibn بيضاء إلا في المسجد except for the masjid. Okay. And Aisha, the Jinnah is they asked the Aisha 
رضي الله عنه about permission to bring the جنازة of سعد بن أبي وقاص في المسجد in the مسجد فتصلى عليه فأنكر الناس so the people said no 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 you can't bring the dead body into the مسجد this is another hadith ذلك عليها قال فقالت ما أسرع ما نسيا نسيا الناس what has happened so quickly that people forgot ما صل ما صل رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم على سحيل ابن بيضاء إلا في المسجد. The Prophet didn't pray for Suhail ibn Baydaw except in the masjid. Now, so here's the situation. The Prophet prayed for someone in the masjid. Now, because the Prophet prayed for someone usually outside the masjid, the Hanafi school of thought and the Hanafi methodology is, if the Prophet did something exceptionally, there must have been a reason. And Imam Shafi has the opinion that if the Prophet did something exceptionally, that is to give the exception. That is to show it's better to do it here, but it's okay over here. And the Hanafi opinion is no. If the Prophet had a praise to play, pray, and there was no exception, and then he prayed in the masjid, so uh, unless there was an exception, then he, if he prayed, then if he prayed in the masjid, that was out of an exception. Maybe it was raining. Maybe it was bad weather. Maybe something happened. So there is a certain assumption by the legalist. Why did this? Difference occur. You have to come up with some reason. Right? And so you clearly find Aisha on one side, other companions on the other side. Right? And uh, so, uh, they said no to her. You're wrong. And she said, She said, What's happened to people so quickly that they forgot? So, my point is, it should become clear to you if you're actually reading the text with me, that things are not always black and white, as in, there's a hadith and it answers all your questions. You have to combine all the narrations. You have to look at multiple cases. Only here we've looked at very few narrations and only two different cases. Right? But you would have to look at multiple narrations, multiple cases, bring them all together and come to some sort of conclusion but you have to have a method to do that you can't just arbitrarily do that and so i want muslims to realize that i want muslims to realize more often than not there's usually a reason why a different scholar holds a different opinion and more often than not these arguments have gone to such level of justification that they run in circles meaning you, if you're trying to argue with Imam Shafi'i, Imam Shafi'i is going to break your neck. And if you're trying to sh argue with Imam Abu Hanifa, he's going to break your neck. You know, if you argue with the son of his brother, he may break your neck too. Depending upon the, because you know, when you say Salafi, the biggest problem with Salafi is, is that which Salafi, you know, which group of scholars are we talking about? They have like more than 70 groups within themselves in, 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 in you know, each each person's and it is just not a Salafi problem, but uh, the the biggest problem with the Salafi brothers is how much ta'assub, how much uh, um, ta'assub they have towards others many times. And again, this is not about all the Salafi brothers. There's some Salafi brothers. They're very 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 beautiful. And I've studied with the Salafi brothers. I've studied in Salafi masajids from a very young age. Um, and so I owe them, and, and, and they were part of my growth. Um, and, and at the end of the day, whether you're part of any of the mazahibs, right, you are as you want to. Everybody wants to follow the salaf. And, uh, but we always forget that, you know, Abu Hanifa was the teacher of Abdullah bin Mubarak, who was the teacher of Imam Bukhari. So uh, a lot of times uh, we, uh, we have this ta'asub. Oh, this person didn't know hadith, right? I mean, it, it's it's that that bothers me. It's it's that attitude that bothers me. Not the fact that we have to find everything in Quran and Sunnah. But now I want to come to another point. And that is that you had the people in Medina, the children of the Sahaba, the children of the Sahaba, they did not pray Janazah inside a masjid. And the people of Kufa, where was the Darul Khilaf of Ali radiallahu anh, they didn't pray um, inside a, a masjid either. 
So you had both of the two great imams, Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik, Imam Malik agreeing that the janazah should not be done in the masjid. So you have this tradition. And then on the other side, you have Imam Shafi Ahmed bin Hanbal. And, and this is a very interesting case because you'll sometimes find these things in pairs. Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik on one side on many, many key issues. And then Ahmed bin Hanbal and Imam Shafi on the other side on a lot of key issues. So when you're looking at the text only, you'll reach one conclusion. But when you are living amongst the children of the Sahaba, you're living in that city where the children of the Sahaba are already practicing something, then you're not only looking at the text, you're also looking at what they were doing. And so that changes your judgment based upon your personality and how you look at things. When the time of Imam Shafi Ahmed bin Hanbal came, those children of the Sahaba were passing away. They had already passed away. And so they had mostly the text to use at that time to make their decision. And so here it is. Uh, but today we live in a situation where there is no place to bring the body many times other than the masjid. And so it is especially, especially important uh, that when it comes to the collective, we look to the easy way and to make things easy for the people. And if the people follow an easy way, we should not we should not be like, oh, this is the Hanafi Methodist to pray outside the masjid for janazah. And since they're praying the janazah of my friend inside the masjid, therefore I'm not going to pray with them. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. You know, that is a bigger sin than the good deed you think you're trying to do. You know, in fact, uh, I'll end with this point that... Um, we live in times where if you know the basics of your deen, number one, about like the halal and the haram and the awamir, the things you've commanded to do like prayers, fasting, hajj, you know the basics of those and you take them from any school of thought. You're better off taking them from any school of thought and you work on your inner self because of the environment that we're living in. And then after that, you're working to establish the deen of Allah. You're working to... Uh, bring about change in society for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are in a better place than a person who has vast amount of de detailed knowledge uh, about the Sharia, right? But is doing nothing about changing the kufr and ilhad and shirk in the outside world. Um, and, and doing not very much when it comes to their inner self. So anyway... I thought you would find this interesting. Uh, please leave your comments. Subscribe to me. Also, I have a link to another interview of mine, an interview of mine that I've been talking about in the last few days called Boys in the Cave. Um, watch that and, uh, and uh, like it. Uh, that would be great. But also subscribe to my channel and, uh, and look at my videos. Go to my channel. Look at my videos, inshallah. And uh, um, inshallah, let's... Uh, Leave your comments, your ideas, your feedback. Um, was I successful in explaining to you that uh, fiqh uh, is not simply white and black? There can be more than one opinion. It is also valid based upon the text. And uh, this case of the masjid, praying inside the masjid, uh, is an interesting case uh, of that sort. And uh, that uh, it is very tough to make a decision to go with the people, the children of the Medina, or to go with the text. And even the text itself points to different directions because even amongst the Sahaba, there was, as you see, Aisha is on one side and the others. And of course, if Aisha was on one side, other companions were with her. And other side was saying, and they, they were all companions. M many of them may have been great. So uh, things are not always as... Uh, simple as black and white. Uh, Islamic tradition is very rich, it's very sophisticated, it's very detailed, it's, and, and in order to actually properly understand it, you can't just have a linear approach. You have to have a, a non-linear approach to understanding the text. Um, so I'll end here. I hope you liked this. Inshallah, Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakat. Also, uh, please subscribe to my channel. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
make sure to subscribe today and make sure you like and make sure you leave your comments and ideas.